If you brought a Bible with you this morning, you can turn with me to the book of 1 John. This morning we're continuing our summer series in the book of 1 John, looking this morning at chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. Well, that'll be right towards the end of your Bible, and as you turn there, let me pray as we enter into this time of studying God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have together to gather around your Word. God, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that your Word teaches us, that it encourages us. God, we thank you that your Word challenges us and that it warns us as well. And God, we pray that this morning your word would do each of these things in our lives as we give our attention to it. God, we thank you for this time. We devote it now to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible in front of you and you, if you've already glanced down at the maybe the heading or the first verse that we're going to be looking at this morning, you probably already have some thoughts on what we're about to discuss together. Uh, if you haven't yet, let me catch you up to speed. The heading in my Bible reads, Warning concerning Antichrist. And verse 18 begins with these words. Children, it is the last hour, and as you heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. What are your initial thoughts when you hear these words? You don't have to say it out loud, but I can imagine if this crowd is like any other church in, in North America, there's probably some of you sitting here thinking, Oh boy, here we go. All right, bring it on. There's probably some others thinking, oh boy, here we go. And maybe a little bit less excited because when it comes to these types of issues, discussions around things that we call end time matters, these types of things tend to polarize us as believers. Uh, on a couple of different levels. On the first level, there's a polarization that happens between those who have thought a lot about these issues and care very deeply about them, and those who, on the other hand, maybe haven't thought a lot about these issues and don't care very deeply about them either. There's that kind of first level of polarization that happens, but there's a second level that takes place between those who have thought a lot about these issues and care deeply about them. And that's the polarization that takes place between the different theological camps that are awfully fiercely opposed to one another when it comes to these things. I had a friend, or still have a friend, who when he was at Bible college, he was in a class talking about some of these things, and he was told that he had to make up his mind about where he stood on these end times issues. And they told him, you either have to be all-millennial or pre-millennial or post-millennial. And he said, instead, I choose to be pan-millennial. And they said, well, that's not really an option. What do you mean? What's pan-millennial? And he says, I believe that it's all going to pan out in the end. And some of you appreciate that answer, and it resonates with you. Others of you are maybe a little bit annoyed by that answer and think it's a bit of a cop-out. And I think that goes to show the level of polarization that we see on these issues. Some think we need to give them way more attention. Others think probably don't need to give them much attention at all. My hope is that wherever you find yourself this morning as it relates to these issues, that we'll together see that what John's writing about here has direct relevance and application to our lives here today. It's not just some hypothetical discussion about things that will happen in the future. No, John is writing to his readers things that he wants them to take home and take away with them in the actual moments in which they're living. As we'll see together, John's hope is not so much that his readers will think about the end times and what's going to happen then. His hope is that his readers will learn to hold fast to the true gospel message that they have received in the present context. And this is my hope for us all as well. So let's dive in together, reading again from verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. In this verse, John uses two phrases here that don't occur anywhere else in the New Testament outside of his letters. He uses the phrases, the last hour, and he uses the word antichrist. And to understand what John is saying in the verses that we're going to look at this morning, it's critical that we understand how he's using both of these phrases. We'll look at each of them, but we'll start with the phrase that he uses when he says that it is the last hour. 
Now, when most people hear John writing that he is living in the last hour, it sounds like John is saying that he is living in the end times, the time right before the return of Christ. But that interpretation challenges us because, as we know, John wrote these words 2,000 years ago, and we recognize that Jesus hasn't returned yet. And so some people say, well, John must have, he must have been mistaken. He must have thought that he was living in the last hour, but history shows us that it wasn't actually the last hour when he wrote those words down. This is how some people try to process what John is saying here. But this interpretation or this idea is not necessary when we recognize the way in which the New Testament makes use of similar phrases to the last hour. Uh, we see that oftentimes New Testament authors use phrases like the last times or the last days to talk about the entire time between Jesus' first and second coming, not just the very end of that time. Uh, we'll see a few examples of this first in the book of Hebrews. In the first verses of this book, the author writes, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. According to this verse, the author of Hebrews believed that he and his readers were already living in the last days because Jesus had already come into the world. We see a similar idea in the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit's poured out on Pentecost and people are gathered around wondering what's going on as the disciples are speaking in tongues and these other languages that they never heard before. And some people are wondering, are they, are they drunk? What's going on? And Peter stands up and he explains to the crowd, he says, what you're seeing happening right now is happening in fulfillment of the prophecy that Joel made back in the Old Testament. When Joel prophesied, he said, in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter says the prophecy that Joel made about the last days is being fulfilled among us in the days of the early church. In other words, we are experiencing these events of the last days. And so we see that at times these phrases, last days or last times, are used to describe that entire period between Jesus' first and his second coming. But we also see it's not so simple. Because there are other times when the New Testament authors use phrases like this to describe a time that, from their perspective, is still in the future. Again, we'll look at a couple of examples of this. One of them comes from 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes about scoffers who will come in the last day asking, where is the promise of Jesus' coming? Notice that the last days here describe a time that is still in the future, a time when scoffers will come. We see a similar thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where Paul tells his readers, he says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Again, Paul talks about the last days as now something that will happen in the future. And so we see here as well that even though sometimes the phrase last days or last times can describe that entire time between Jesus' first and second coming, there are times when the New Testament authors use it a bit more specifically to talk about the very end of that time period. In other words, what we would describe as the end times. And so the question for us is that when, Peter, when John uses the phrase, the last hour, which way is he using that phrase? Before we answer that question, we'll look at the other phrase that he uses here that is unique to this part of the, of the Bible in John's letters when he talks about the coming of Antichrist. I mentioned before that John is the only one that uses the term Antichrist in his letters, and, and, and that's true. It's not used in Paul's writing. It's not used in the book of Revelation. And yet we still see a similar concept in some of those other books. One commentator explains that throughout the New Testament, we see the general concept of a powerful end-time figure opposed to God. And so, for example, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, we read that before Christ returns, there will be a great rebellion and someone called the man of lawlessness will arise. This person will oppose God and even proclaim himself to be God, receiving worship from the peoples of the earth. In a similar way, in Revelation chapter 13, John sees a vision of a beast arising out of the sea who is given power and a throne and great authority from Satan. The beast exalts himself, blaspheming the living God and receiving worship from the peoples of the earth. 
but the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians and the beast of Revelation 13 are all defeated decisively by Jesus in an instant. So are the Antichrist and the man of lawlessness and the beast of Revelation all different ways of talking about the same end times figure? Well, Christians are going to continue to debate the answer to that question, but what seems clear is that the New Testament presents a picture or a general concept of a powerful end-time figure or maybe several end-time figures opposed to God is deceptively leading people astray. John assumes that his readers are aware of this concept when he writes to them, you know that Antichrist is coming. In other words, he's saying, you know that a powerful end-time figure who is opposed to God is coming. But look at what he says next. He writes, just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, he says, so now many Antichrists have come. John is saying that the Antichrist that you've heard of, maybe he hasn't come yet, but many Antichrists, many false teachers who can rightly bear his name, have already entered into the world. In other words, what John is saying is that even though the Antichrists haven't come, the, the people who have gone out into the world already can be given that name because they are proclaiming the message that one day the Antichrist will proclaim. If we think back to Jesus' conversation with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, we see an analogy, I think, for what John is doing here. There Jesus spoke to his disciples and he told them after he confirmed to them that yes, he was the Christ, he was the Son of the living God, he told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. And Peter, of course, who had just learned that Jesus is the Messiah, he, he couldn't com understand how this was going to happen or how this made sense. And so it says that he took Jesus aside and he rebuked Jesus and he said, Jesus, this will never happen to you. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen. And do you remember how Jesus responded to Peter in that moment? He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because Peter took the position of Satan by seeking to keep Jesus from the cross, Jesus used the name Satan to describe him because the message he was expressing fit that name. I think John is doing something very similar here. Any person, he says, who embraces and spreads the message that Antichrist will one day spread can rightly be called by that name. And so having looked now at both of these phrases and, and seeing how John talks about them, we can paraphrase what he says in verse, eight, verse 18, something along these lines. Because Jesus has come, we are living in the last hour. We know that at the very end of the last days, a powerful end-time figure called the Antichrist will rise in opposition to God. This powerful end-time figure is not yet here, but his message is here, being spread by false teachers who would seek to lead you astray. These antichrists are who you should be extremely concerned about. And as we'll see as we keep reading, John's concern is not going to be so much about what will happen one day in the future that the believers ought to know about. His concern is what the believers are doing in the present moment to hold fast the gospel message that they have received. Of course, John recognizes that one day the Antichrist will come and will lead many people astray. His concern in the present moment, though, is that his readers are not led astray by the false teachers who are seeking to take them out. And so with this being said, we might ask the question, well, who were these Antichrists that John is talking about? And he begins to describe them in verse 19. We see that they are contemporaries of John's readers. Verse 19 says this, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. I think John was a person who liked to, to tell riddles probably around campfires because he's, he, he likes to sometimes say things that when you hear it the first time, you're trying to figure out, what did he, what did he just say? A few weeks ago, we looked at where John writes about a command of Jesus, and he says, this is a new commandment I'm talking about that's really an old commandment that's also a new commandment. And we're wondering, okay, which, which is it? Here John talks about these false teachers who went out from us, but who were not from us, because if they had been from us, they would have continued with us. And again, we're trying to puzzle through what exactly he's saying here. Uh, but even though it might be challenging to follow the first time we read it, I think John's point is fairly clear. 
He's talking about a group of people who at one point were part of this church community who went out from that community to promote their false message and their false gospel. John calls them antichrist. We might use the term anti-missionaries to help us understand what kind of situation is going on here because in many ways they would be the exact opposite to what missionaries were in the church. In the book of Acts and throughout Christian history, we see missionaries are sent out by the church to spread the good news of Jesus. And even though they're separated from the church physically, they are connected to this church spiritually. They go out from the church, but they remain of the church. For these antichrists that John writes about, it's the exact opposite. They leave the church both physically and spiritually. They go out from the church, but they are not of the church. They don't spread the gospel message. They spread instead lies about Jesus. We read about the nature of these lies in verses 22 and 23. John asks the question, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. The Bible teaches us that in the end times, the Antichrist will arise as an object of worship and lead people astray, leading them away from a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And it seems as though this is what the Antichrists are trying to do to John's readers, to lead them away from a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. These false teachers apparently believed that it was possible to, to know God without knowing his son, Jesus Christ. They thought it was possible to have a relationship with God without a relationship with Jesus Christ, the son. They spread false teaching about the identity and significance of Jesus. And if you go through John's letters and read all the different things they said about Jesus or they taught about Jesus, we see at least three disturbing things in relation to their Christology or in terms of their belief about Jesus. We see that it had a denial that Jesus was the Messiah, a denial that Jesus came in the flesh, and a denial that Jesus' death was real and vicarious. In other words, that his death was for our sins and, and died in our place. According to these false teaching antichrists, the only thing that was wrong with Christianity was that it was about Jesus. And so they saw it a different way, both for themselves and others. As they had been deceived, so they, ought to, so they tried to deceive others as well. In verse 26, John, or John writes, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And so we sum this all up by saying these false teachers originated from within the church. They denied the true identity and significance of Jesus and they sought to leave other believers astray down the same path of unbelief. And when we phrase it like this, we recognize that this is something we're still dealing with today in the church as well. Because probably all of us can think of a contemporary example of someone who started within the church world or the ministry world who, who'd rejected the faith and, and renounced their faith to Jesus and then started telling lies about Jesus to lead people astray and to deceive others to follow them down that same path of disbelief. This is not something new that happens in our day. This is something that's been going on from the very beginning. And we see it's often those who started out within the church world and had a large influence who are the most destructive in these ways. Charles Templeton was a well-known evangelist and former colleague of Billy Graham, and he renounced his faith uh, quite publicly many, many years ago. One of the things he did after renouncing his faith, though, was, was not to kind of just go quietly. He wrote a book in which he sought to provide an explanation as to why he rejected his faith, why he walked away. And in that book, he argued, there, there's good reasons for me to reject the Christian faith, and probably his implication was, and you should consider them as well. Uh, some of you may have heard of Abraham Piper, son of well-known pastor John Piper, who, again, quite publicly renounced his faith and now runs a popular social media channel in which he makes videos on everything he thinks is wrong with evangelical Christianity and why good and decent people shouldn't trust the Bible and what it says. The, the damaging effects of these types of things are so far-reaching, but it's not only limited to those with some large platform of followers. Uh, there's many people who have this effect on a much smaller and localized scale. I knew a young man personally who renounced his faith and made a, a video he sent out to all his friends and just kind of told us all how, how silly he thought we were for, for praying to the ceiling, essentially, and, and he wanted us to reconsider our faith 
unfounded belief in God, as he called it. And I know that this young man was not alone. There's many like him who describe themselves as formal, former evangelicals who have deconstructed their faith, by which we mean that they've critically examined their faith and they've chosen to reject it, and now they seek to explain Christianity in ways that don't have any reference to the one true living God. They try to now explain Christianity just as a man-made religion. So for them, the Bible is no longer God's word, but just a human document with outdated ideas about morality and, and these types of matters. For them, there's no such thing as a prompting of the Holy Spirit, but only peer pressure from other believers. For them, there's no miraculous answers to prayer, only sometimes maybe coincidences that can't be explained by the scientific community. Now, some people, when they struggle with their faith or when they walk away from their faith, they go quietly, but these former evangelicals who actively and aggressively seek to lead other people down the same path of disbelief, I think they match the description in many ways of the false teachers that John calls antichrists. Now please hear me, I don't say this lightly whatsoever. And neither does John. But the Bible reserves some of its strongest language for those who would intentionally and actively pull people away from faith in Jesus, especially young people from faith in Jesus. John uses language to match the situation he is observing. See, John doesn't use the term antichrist to describe non-believers in general or unbelievers or those who haven't heard about Jesus. He uses it specifically to talk about those who went out from the church spreading lies about Jesus to deceive believers, to draw them away from faith in Christ. This is who John is talking about. And he uses strong language to address this dangerous situation. Now let me just say this. It's I think, very normal to have questions about our faith. It's very normal to have questions about God, questions about the Bible, questions about prayer and answers to prayer and and miracles and, and all these different things. It's natural even, I'd say, to have questions, even doubts about our faith at times. I think of the man that came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I believe, and then he said, help my unbelief. I think it's natural for there to be t- questions that we have and parts of us that doubt and, and wonder about certain things, but I want to say it's very important what you do with those questions and doubts and who you take them to to find guidance in those times. Because I think now more than ever, there's so many former evangelicals who would just love to walk with you through your questions and doubts. They love to tell you that you're, you're Christian friends, your Christian family, your, your pastor, your parents, they've never, they've never even thought about the things that you're thinking of. They've never considered the things that you're wrestling with. They would have no idea how to help you with these things because they're just so ignorant to all this stuff. And they'd be happy to just enlighten you and walk you down that path from doubt to full-fledged rejection of faith. But I want to encourage you today, take your doubts, take your questions to mature believers who are able to help you thoughtfully and carefully walk through these issues. Don't for a second believe the lie that nobody's ever thought about this thing before, that no one's ever wrestled with this question before. No one's ever had this kind of doubt or noticed this about this passage of Scripture. No, there's people who have asked all the questions you're asking, who have wrestled with all the things you're wrestling with, and have come out the other side with a strong faith in God and his faith in the authority and accuracy of his word. I want to encourage you, take your questions and your doubts to these types of people. I think one of my favorite things about Bible college, and there was a lot of things I loved about it, was just being in classrooms where you would, you would study the scriptures together and you come across difficult passages and, and maybe in the dorms you come across questions that were just challenging to our faith and challenging to, to how do you kind of process all these things. And it was so amazing to be in this context where you could walk alongside professors and other dorm leaders who had wrestled through these same questions and come out the other side with a strong faith. It helped us to wrestle with these same things in a way that also strengthened our faith, not taken away from it. I want to encourage you to seek out those people in your life. Take your questions and your doubts, which you will inevitably have. Take them to strong believers who will help you to walk through them. But as you do that, and this is where it gets interesting 
we don't just accept what those strong believers say because they say it. We accept it because it lines up with the truth of God's word that the Holy Spirit has impressed upon our hearts. See, it's interesting. John, he confronts the lies of these false teachers and he wants his readers to have his perspective, but he doesn't want them to have it just because it's his perspective. He's saying, I want you to believe these things because this is what the Holy Spirit is going to confirm in your hearts in terms of the truth of the gospel message. John's saying, believe what I'm saying insofar as it agrees and conforms to the truth of God's word, which the Holy Spirit confirmed in your hearts when you first believed. And this is where it's so interesting. John, as an apostle, as someone who walked with Jesus, he doesn't appeal to his own authority. First and foremost, he appeals to the authority of the Holy Spirit, to the truth of Jesus in their lives. Uh, Listen with me as we read verses 20 and 21. John says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. In verse 27 he says, But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now it's interesting that John says you don't need anyone to teach you because of the anointing you have received. And, and people have, I think, misunderstood this verse in a couple of different ways. First, some people have said, oh, this teaches us that we don't need to have Christian teachers of any kind. We can just kind of manage quite well on our own. Uh, there's a number of reasons we could challenge this interpretation, but I think the most obvious one here is that John himself devoted his life to being a Christian teacher. In the early church, he was one of the apostles that said, we need to to have other people in leadership so we can devote ourselves to the ministry of the Word of God and to prayer. And so John devoted his life to being a Christian teacher. This whole letter is full of his teachings to other Christians. And so I don't think what he's saying is we don't need Christian teachers at all. Neither is John saying that what what some people suggest by this verse, that every interpretation of Scripture is valid because we all have the Holy Spirit. Uh, Some people will say, well, you can't say that my interpretation is wrong because I've got the Holy Spirit, you've got the Holy Spirit, so it's kind of truth is more of a subjective thing, and this is my truth, and that might be your truth. No, John is very clear as well that there is a standard of truth in God's Word. We can't just choose what's true and what's false. That's already made clear for us. And so why would then John say that the anointing that they've received means that they don't need anyone to teach them? I think John is saying something very specific here, and to understand it, we need to recognize that he's actually alluding back to a passage from the Old Old Testament, something we already read this morning at the beginning of our time together. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah talks about the days that are coming when God would create a new covenant with his people. And this is what he says in Jeremiah 31, verse 33 to 34. God says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the very least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. This promise is an amazing promise. It's actually restated by Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 45. Jesus applies these words to himself. Listen to what he says. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. I think what John is telling us here, what Jesus is saying in John chapter 6, is that for new covenant believers, the truth that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Savior, is written on the hearts of believers. Jesus has given believers the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which confirms to them the truth of this message that they heard when they first believed. And so John is saying in relation to the truth that's been written on your hearts by the Holy Spirit, the truth that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus died for your sins, he's saying, I don't need to teach you that because the Holy Spirit has already taught you that when he wrote the truth on your hearts when you first believed. John's saying, I'm not telling you anything new here that you haven't heard before. I'm not teaching you something that's that's a novel idea. I'm I'm trying to tell you to hold fast to what you have already received and already know what the Holy Spirit has already taught you. 
And so, yes, John would say teachers are, are important. It's important to have people leading us through the truth and helping us to see how Scripture applies. And all these things, he devoted his life to teaching. He says, we can be thankful for Christian teachers, but the greatest teacher, the most important teacher that we have is the Holy Spirit who writes the truth of Jesus on our hearts. And John says, therefore, I'm not not teaching you something new, but I'm telling you to hold on to that which you already have. Hold fast to this teaching about Jesus. And so as the worship team makes their way back up, I want to leave us with this challenge, this exhortation that John gives in verse 24. These words that his readers had to hear in their present context, we need to hear just as much today. He says this, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. Hold fast to that message. Don't let anything hold you back. Seek out teachers and and, and mature Christians who will help you to hold fast to that message that the Holy Spirit has impressed upon our hearts when we first believed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your word that warns us of those who would seek to lead us astray, who would seek to spread lies about Christ, who draw us towards unbelief. God, we thank you for those people in our lives who draw us towards you. We thank you, God, for those who draw us towards the truth of your word and who encourage and exhort us. And God, as we have been reminded this morning that we are to hold fast, God, that you would help us in our lives to hold fast the message of Jesus that as the Holy Spirit has written on our hearts the truth of Jesus, that we would hold fast and call each other to do the same. God, help us in our questions, help us in our doubts, help us to recognize that there are so many others who have wrestled with the same things we're wrestling with and who have recognized your goodness and your faithfulness and your trustworthiness in all of them. God, would you increase our faith? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.